Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sallenberger. On today's podcast, I chat with Joanne Twombly about IMS and dissociation. Hey, everyone. Good to be back. I feel like it's been a really long time. On today's episode, I'm super excited to talk to certified IFS therapist Joanne Twombly. Joanne wrote a chapter in the IFS New Dimensions book entitled Integrating Phase Oriented Treatment of Clients with Dissociative Disorders. We talk about lots of possible controversial issues, controversial in the IFS world, such as why we still need coping skills, why diagnosis is helpful, and just the idea of integrating IFS into phase-oriented treatment. I have loved this conversation, and there's so many parts that I just was cracking up laughing, but we are talking about dissociation, which means we're talking about trauma. There is a moment at the 50-minute mark that is quite upsetting and could possibly be triggering, so I just wanted to give you a heads up and a little bit of a warning about that. You can connect with me at the One Inside Facebook page and on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at IFS Tammy. You can also join my email list for a free get to know a should part meditation and to get all the new book updates. My book will be out January 2022 at TammySollenberger.com. Enjoy. So how I like to start this is just telling everybody where you are in the world. And if you looked out your nearest window, what would you see? (laughs) Okay. Leaves. Leaves, yes. Yeah. And where are you in the world? Oh, where am I in the world? You wanted me to answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. yes, I do. <laughs> well, I'm in Arlington, Massachusetts in the United States. And I'm looking out at a bunch of leaves because we live in a tiny house that abuts some conservation land. Oh, that's great. So it's great. really pretty. Great. And the leaves are kind of brown now. They're past peak. We're, we're kind of way past peak, aren't we? Yeah, we still have yellow ones. Yeah, well, that's good. It is. It's nice. Yeah. And you um, did your first level one in 2006. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that and tell me um, what made you interested in IFS and doing a level one in 2006. (laughs) Well, I since I work with dissociative disorders, I've been working with parts for years. And I went to a New England Society for the Treatment of Trauma and Dissociation meeting, and Mike Elkin was presenting on IFS. And I was like, heard him talk about managers and exiles. And I was like, I don't need this crap. I am going to, I know enough about ego state work. But I talked all a lot of the people in my consultation groups into going to NESTTD meetings. And then the next group, they all came in asking questions and wanting to know more. So I was like, dang, I have to learn this. So I started learning it and found that the language was really helpful to incorporate in the way I work with dissociative disorders. And you know, helpful working with myself, helpful working in consultation groups. I mean, I mostly do, I do an IFS EMDR consultation group. And then I do an alphabet soup one that's sort of EMDR, IFS, DID, um, and whatever else. <laughs> and, um, but other, the others are EMDR ones, but I always use the fire drill in them because it's just such a dynamite exercise in sorting through countertransference. I love it. Okay. So we talked about having the listeners do a little bit of fire drill before they even begin um, or before we jump into the podcast and before people really get into the meat of the, of what we're going to talk about today. So do you want to lead us in a fire drill? <laughs> well, I guess I would just say simply um, the topic. I mean, we're talking about using IFS with dissociative disorders complex PTSD. And generally speaking, IFS says that you can do IFS with anybody. And what I'm saying is really it needs something added to it. And so I think that hardcore IFS people, I would just ask anybody listening to get into self 
and to notice if there are any parts that are up about me casting aspersions on IFS, which I love. And, um, you know, thinking, oh no, nothing needs to be added. It's perfect just the way it is. There is a lot about IFS that I think is perfect. It's a real power therapy. But working with complicated people, it helps to have some extra things. But in any case, so focus inside and notice if there are any parts saying this is bullshit or, oh no, this, this is not standard IFS, danger, danger. And just ask those parts what their concerns are. And then ask them what they need from you to be able to let you listen to this podcast in self and be curious and open and receptive. That's great. Tony Irvine Blanc talks about it when, when I did the training with her. Um, I don't work with couples, but I did her whole training, which was quite wonderful. Um, and she did this when you're working with couples and you want one cup, one, say the husband or the wife to listen to their spouse. And so it's all about getting into self and being receptive and curious and centered. And that's what I would ask people to be in listening to this podcast. Great. I love it. I am. Um... <clears throat> I love that. And so we call it the fire drill. Do you know why we, so if you do a level one training, um, we always do this fire drill exercise. So do you know why we call it the fire drill? Um, I guess my, my thought would be that there, I used to be actually on an, a volunteer fire department um, in college. That's how I learned to drive standard. I learned to drive standard on a 1946 Maxim pumper. (laughs) Um, how many people can say that? But anyway, um, is that a fire truck? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It was an old one. Didn't have a lot of money in this college (laughs) for new fire trucks. Um, but my concept of the fire drill is that, you know, there are all these people like running around in different directions. And what the fire drill does is corral them and gets them to all work together. And that's my image of, you know, if I'm going into a session and it's a client who stirs up a lot of counter transference, whether it's my stuff, their stuff, uh, reenactment, so it's both of our stuffs, you know, there can be parts all over the place. I need to get my parts organized. And if yeah. I'm organized and my parts are organized and I'm centered and I'm in what I call my self-led um, adult therapy self, um, then things go better in session. Yeah. So I love it. why do you call it the fire drill? That's my thought. Yeah, I think that's great. I actually never knew. Like in every, every time, like I just like a month or so ago, I was in a level one and they're like, okay, we're gonna do the fire drill. And I was like, what's that exercise again? Um, and so I, I was actually curious cause I actually didn't know, but it makes sense though, because it's a quick way of getting into self. It's, it was a, a quick way of asking your parts to step back and give you, give you some space. So I love that, right? Like what, what parts are up? What are the concerns? What do they need from me? And can they let me just be here and listen and be open? Mm-hmm. I love it. And what we do, do that with our- me to know yeah. about the client and then, or the situation and what do they need from me to be able to let me handle it from my adult therapist self. Yeah. And um, what a great way of handling counter-transference, like in the yeah. session, like in a session when you're with a client and you notice there's some activity and then you can be like, okay can I do this really quickly? Like in a fire drill, like if there's a fire, we need to be quick. We need to be efficient and get out of here. And I think it's a matter of practice too. I mean, I've done it a bazillion times or something. And I can say to a client, you know, I am scrambled and I need a few minutes here to just get my thoughts settled. 
and I do the fire drill. That's great. And I have my parts hide in my hair, which I have a lot of. So that works for us. I love it. I love that so much. Or sometimes I'll draw a little picture of parts that are getting in the way or informing me actually, because, you know, my parts that say, oh my God, why can't I be on vacation this week? You know, it's like a distracting part. And then I can ask the part, what's going on that you want to ask? Mm. You know, it's informative. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that. Yeah. So, I mean, that reminds me of dissociative parts, right? Like they're getting Mm -hmm. in the way and they're giving us information. So I like to hear how you, we, we talked the other night and you said dissociative parts are different. So I want to know what that means when you say that. Well, I think it's all a continuum. So it's not like they're coming from another planet. And one thing that's really <laughs> nice, well, I mean, sometimes people come in and they're like, I'm just crazy. Yeah. Or they're so phobic of the parts that they have no parts. And if you start, I've consulted on cases where people say, yeah, we're going to do IFS and this is wonderful. And we all have parts and they never see the person. And it's like, what happened? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's that this is a person with a dissociative disorder and having parts be secret was what helped them survive their childhood. And then coming into therapy, it's like, oh my God, a 180. Mm -hmm. Talk about your parts. You've got parts. And it's like, oh no, I'm out of here. Yeah. Secrecy yeah. was what kept me alive. Yeah. And it's just too much all at once. But what I, the way I think about it is I talk about, I say, we all have parts. And there's the couch potato part of me and the professional part of me and the, the, the obsessive put professional part of me if I'm giving presentations. Um, there's the low, you know different levels of professional me's and there's the play with the kids across the street level. Mm. And then, you know, but I can go from playing with the kids across the street to taking a professional phone call and there's a fluid transfer of information and, you know, it's just easy. Mm. Someone who grows up in a complicated childhood, it's more like their cement walls among the parts and they can get stuck in one part. And there isn't that kind of fluid transfer of information. Mm. It's not like there's no information, but it can really seem that way. And that's different. I mean, I think that's one thing. The other thing is that people with dissociative disorders, their parts are carrying burdens that can be really volcanic. Um, It's not, and I... (laughs) this is terrible. I was going to say, it's not just a little bit of abuse. It's like abuse every single day or major attachment problems, major abandonment. And so there's a system. If they've never had therapy, there's a system inside that's kind of keeping a lid on everything or many lids on everything. And then one of the issues is, is that if a therapist goes in and accesses what's under the lid without these parts having coping skills, it can be a disaster. Yeah. It can take somebody who's functioning to somebody who isn't functioning. I was going to say, I know IFS, it, it does. It really appealed to me when I first was learning it. No, no coping skills. I don't have to do stabilization skills with clients. No, Uh, that went out the window fairly quickly. And the way I think of it is, you know, and I think phase-oriented treatment is sort of misunderstood in IFS. I've heard people say it doesn't. If you're using phase-oriented treatment, those therapists kick out parts they don't like, like suicidal parts. That's not true. That would be malpractice for one thing. And it wouldn't work. So it would be a waste of time. And who's got time to waste when they've been through a dreadful childhood and they're in pain? Mm -hmm. Um, 
So now, now I'm losing track of what I was going to say. It was eloquent, though. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I think that any therapist, any trauma therapist would say that we all have the capacity to heal. It may be deeply buried. It may be unlikely, or we may not have the technology to help someone heal these days, but we're born with the innate capacity to heal. And I know that IFS says, if you get into self, that's all there. Suddenly it's possible. So that's one of the reasons why we don't need coping skills in IFS. But what I would say is, you know, we don't get born knowing how to ride a bike. We get taught. So people who grow up in these this difficult families, they don't have parents who can teach them affect management skills that you get in a healthy childhood or even a, you know, shaky childhood. They don't teach you, you don't get a secure foundation that says that if there's a problem, you can get help. Or if there's a problem right now, um, something will happen that'll help you figure it out. And that's what I do with coping skills. The other thing I learned along with my trauma training and training and working with people with dissociative disorders is you wanna keep people at the highest level of functioning that they have or a higher level of functioning. So you don't want them to call you during the week. I mean, not that I don't take calls during the week, but you want them to have coping skills so they can use them. Yeah. And so that's, I don't know if that's answering your question of how I see parts a little differently. The other thing with working with dissociative disorders that's very clear to me is all parts have self. And so I'm not just working on finding self because the concept is just way too difficult for most people with dissociative disorders. It's just like, no, I'm completely fragmented inside. What, what kind of bullshit is this? You know, and it's just can end up being a power struggle that again, is not helpful. So most of the work is done in direct access, um, which is really the most efficient way to go with this population at least for a long time. And it's, it's also interesting because one of the first tasks in treatment is standard trauma treatment is developing internal communication and cooperation, which is very similar to IFS, but it's cooperation and communication among all the parts. So the parts are helping each other out and they're reminding each other about coping skills, teaching each other about coping skills, sorting through cognitive distortions. I mean, people can have very complicated systems and with, without that, treatment would take forever. So those are some of the differences I can see off the top of my head. That's great. Um, so I want to unpack that a little bit. Is that, that's okay. So sure. one, one of the things that you said is that um, people will end up coming to you because they're, they're doing IFS, they're doing IFS with expert IFS people, and they're getting worse and worse and worse. And so it sounds like what happens is we, we get under the trash can lid too fast and yep. maybe the, okay. Okay. And so then we get out of the trash can lid and we muck about in there and then and the person doesn't have coping skills. And so in self, I mean, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but self isn't enough. Oh, I feel uncomfortable and, saying that. <laughs> well, and I think the other thing is, is you don't, you're not even going to get to self. Right. Okay. Right. Cause we're just it's mucking or, about what you're kind of messing with all the parts. Get, or you're gonna get somebody who's compliant, who says I'm in self and I have compassion for all my parts. Okay, yeah. Who, that's the other category that I've seen with, you know, working, doing consultations or picking up cases from really good IFS therapists. And it's either that you go under the trash can too fast and then 
that lid is useless rather than taking that lid and making it a better lid. Like I pull out my iPhone and I say, we didn't have these phones. We had, when we were kids, we had flip phones. You probably had a flip phone. I had a dial phone. What we want to upgrade the lid to yeah. a higher level lid, a more current lid that's more useful. Yeah. So an all or nothing lid might become a lid that has a window in it. You can open the window and let 5% of the burden out, work with that, and then do another 5%. It's not like you pop the lid and it all comes out. And it. if you pop the lid, it's like Pandora's box. You can open it, can't really close it. So you don't want to open it. Yeah. And it's, it's much more difficult working with somebody who's been opened up too fast. So the other category of people who I've worked with are people who've done a bunch of IFS and have made a bunch of progress, hasn't reached the trauma. And it might feel like a successful treatment. None of the trauma has been touched. So that what was worked on, you know, and these are people who have in some ways, really powerful systems where they're like, I'm not letting you in there. Mm. It's a mess in there. I'm staying away from it. Um, so, you know, there's a trauma that's been hidden by dissociation. Dissociation is amazing. Mm. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, the thought about these childhoods is the best way to get through it is to have a healthy ability to dissociate. We're not all born that way. I mean, it's like sports ability. Some people are better at it than others. And it's pretty remarkable. So if you're working with someone or if, if you're doing a consultation with someone who um, that's been their experience, they're, they're functioning okay and they're, they've done IFS work and they've you know, gotten to know their parts and they've got some self-energy, but they haven't touched the trauma. How do you approach that person? Um, well, probably now that, that would be sort of in some ways easy. This is a person who's not totally phobic of having parts, but they've got a part that's keeping a lid on a bunch of stuff. So probably what I would do is identify that and say, you know, there's this protective part that's got this lid on top of some of the stuff left over from your childhood that carries a lot of pain. Let's get to know, I want us to get to know that part that's managing this lid. I love it, okay. And then what I say is let this part, no, I want this part to know that we are not taking any control away. In fact, we want this part to have more control and more choices. And we're not going to work on any of the other parts until this, this lid part says it's okay. Because we don't want to go there. Yeah. What we want to do is ideally form an alliance with this lid part and use that part to protect the client from overwhelm and decompensation. Yeah. That's and great. I want to say this is, you know, this is not picking on IFS therapists. This is across the board with therapists. A lot of therapists don't know how to diagnose people with dissociative disorders. Something else IFS doesn't like because they think because of the concern that diagnosis is pathologizing. Now I think of diagnosis as like cliff notes. Like if somebody says, oh, this person has complex PTSD, I know they dissociate because PTSD is a dissociative disorder. I know there was some stuff in their childhood. There's probably attachment problems. They probably don't have enough coping skills. But I'm not going to take it as the gospel until I know the person. And I've done my own process. But it's really shorthand. And that's helpful. And particularly when people have more complex trauma disorders, it's really useful. It's useful to know if somebody's got a dissociative disorder. 
someone's got a dissociative disorder and they've done a bunch of superficial work, however positive that is, you know there's more stuff under the lid. Mm. And you know that you want to be careful about how you work with that. So you don't pop the lids before the person has the ability to deal with what's under them. Yeah. So I think the other thing is that it's not just exiles. I mean, exiles do have jobs and their job is to carry burdens. And man, if we didn't have exiles carrying burdens, people would not be functional. Mm. And I think that you know, that's part of respecting them. Mm. And managers have burdens and so do firefighters. Like a, a manager burden would be having been given the job of bringing themselves up or being nice to everybody or they get abandoned or complying. You know, those are burdens also. Mm. And, you know, you just kind of strip back the layers of a firefighter and you get lots of burdens. Mm. They're often very traumatized parts. Mm. So <clears throat> what about the first characteristic, the first uh, type of person we talked about where they come into your office and um, the parts that dissociate are so up that they're, they're either sleepy or they're not present or there's not like you can't really there's nothing you're like I don't know what to do this part the part of you that's always tired or the part of you that's that's not that's zoning out um what do you do when you have that sort of the opposite it's not the opposite well, when somebody sort of the comes other. in I mean I listen to them on the phone and then I listen to them when I come in and I have a laundry list in my head of you know what am I looking I mean people tend to send difficult people to me. So that's mostly who I work with. But if I get somebody just who's randomly coming in, I'm going to be checking them out. And, you know, I know what to look for. So if the person says, no, I can't read, I can't focus. I'm like, okay, so maybe they have ADHD. Maybe there's a part that's getting in the way of them being able to read. I had one client who had ADHD when she came in and learning disabilities and couldn't read. She left being able to read just fine. It had to do with parts and it had to do with burdens. And, you know, that all, not magically, but cleared up. So I've heard, I think, I think Mike Elkin said, something about ADHD is about dissociation. Like that's what it is. I think that there is some hardwiring brain ADHD, but the crossover between ADHD, OCD, and trauma is massive. Mm. Um, and often, you know, you'll get somebody diagnosing someone. This is the bad side of diagnosis is if therapists have someone coming in that say, oh yeah, you've got OCD, you have ADHD. And they take that as the gospel rather than saying, okay, is there a trauma history? You know, maybe, maybe this will clear up if we clear up the trauma. Yeah. If we're not trauma curious. Very, like, if we're not curious, exactly. And if we don't hold that kind of question in mind, like I really don't know here. Yeah. Could be that you have OCD or it could be that it's a symptom of trying to organize something when your life was so chaotic growing up. We'll figure it out. It'll be interesting. I love that. I love how hopeful that is too. And I love that. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, really seeing symptoms as things that are helpful along with dissociation. I mean, people, yeah. sometimes therapists say, oh, she's dissociating less. That's great. That's not great. You want them dissociating better, like being able to choose to put a lid on things or choose to have 5% come out, but have that more control and choices, which is also part of healing from a trauma history or attachment, neglect, et cetera. 
um, is those aren't childhoods where you get control and choices. Mm. So having control and choices over your symptoms and healing process is a really good thing. You don't want them just to not dissociate at all. You want them to have more control over the dissociation. And in IFS terms, would that be because if they weren't dissociating at all, that would be a manager that's controlling the dissociation, like not controlling it, but sort of like not allowing that part to dissociate. Like that would be. Yeah. I'm like, I would, I say, give permission to all parts to continue to dissociate traumatic material Aww. or burdens okay. until we figure out how they can cope with them. Okay. Okay. And do it in a way where they have control and choice. I love that. Right. Because they didn't have control and choice. Because sometimes, you know, inadvertently with, I mean, the other thing that I think is different about these parts, um, and it is a continuum. I'm not saying that these parts are like completely different or anything. Um, It's that like, I can ask an exile, I can say, ask this little kid part, this exile, to hold the burdens so you you don't get overwhelmed. But what if that exile doesn't, is dissociated from the burdens or knows a little bit about them, but doesn't know the the dimension of them? So that part could say, in all honesty, yeah, I can hold that. I won't overwhelm you. get totally overwhelmed so I use that concept I would always say I want you to hold that burden and then I might say is that possible or what do you think about developing a container to put a bunch of the burdens in so we can just work one at a time or a percent at a time Mm -hmm. that brings back to mind this idea of phase oriented treatment and teaching coping skills, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit of a no-no in IFS world. So tell everybody, if you can, just briefly, what is phase-oriented treatment and then how you would teach coping skills while you're, yeah, how would you do that? Um, You know, it fits in really well. I mean, phase-oriented treatment is, is the it's researched, it's the recommended way to work with people with dissociative disorders and complex PTSD. And um, the, the, I think Janae started it back in the 1880s and 90s and wrote tons about it. It kind of fell out of favor for a while because it, dissociative disorder, disorders got subsumed under the umbrella of schizophrenia, you know, split mind, different parts, which was unfortunate. But basically what phase-oriented treatment is, the three phases of trauma treatment. The first one is developing the therapeutic relationship with boundaries because people who grow up in really difficult families don't know anything about boundaries or they know about bad boundaries boundaries keep shifting. So how do they know about boundaries in therapy? You say, you can give me a call when you're feeling bad. Well, they may be feeling bad all the time. You may start getting flooded. They need to know we're working on coping skills so that you have the ability to deal with stuff in between sessions. So it's developing the treatment relationship, teaching coping skills, affect management, And with dissociative disorders, it's like internal communication, cooperation, and some orienting the parts to the present. Mm. So we know exiles, for instance, actually managers can be, and firefighters also can be living in the past. Mm. And it's helpful if um, they have some kind of idea about the present. Yeah. Because sometimes you'll get a part that'll say, no, I can't, I can't do any healing because it's dangerous, you know, and it is dangerous. Right. I've heard 
Dick say once, and I like this line, um, that if a kid gets into self in a dysfunctional family, I'm not sure he said they get their feet kicked out from under them, but that's my concept of it. Yeah. You know, it'd be more dangerous for them, potentially. Totally dangerous. So you want to hide self. Yeah. Which is also probably one of the problems with accessing it. Right. Um, just right. takes a lot more energy. So, so the updating. second phase is paste uncovering of traumatic material. So it's doing the witnessing and the unburdening, but in a paced way so it's manageable. So it's not just following a trail him because the trailhead could lead to hell mm -hmm. and that's going to be too much. Um, and so it's paste uncovering of traumatic material, paste unburdening. Um, and then the third phase is whatever else. <laughs> Suggesting to life that's not organized around trauma and burdens. Mm, wow. And so it can be relationship building. I mean, you, there are also different ways of coping. You might have to adjust coping skills. It depends on how much of a hold the person's been in. Mm. But that's the third level. And these, these are not linear steps. So that if you're doing um, witnessing and unburdening, and the person's not managing during the week, or suddenly needs to call you a whole bunch of times, you know, you have to go back to phase one. Yeah. Not just, you know, that I think it came from Al Anon. Um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Somebody's not doing well during phase two, they go back to phase one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's great. It's like debugging a computer, too. It's not a failure. It's like, oh, we found something that we didn't know about. Because mm. the person's dissociative. So there are all these things swirled away under various lids. Mm. I remember a, one client said, oh, there's a whole bunch of parts we don't know. None of them have safe spaces. They're mm. all present. So we still didn't know them, but we made a safe space for all of them. And then we continued. So we went from phase two back to phase one, then back to phase two. Mm. It reminds so those me, are the three phases. I love it. I love it. And it reminds me of um, DBT, which I was training in DBT and that idea of like teaching mindfulness and teaching the core mindfulness skills. And that's kind of where you start with, you start teaching awareness and observing. And, um, and it sounds like that's what, you, that's an example DBT of maybe is, what you would do. DBT is great. It's also very left brain. Most people with big trauma histories can't meditate yeah. because they start relaxing their surface level defenses. And that's when they get intrusive thoughts and feelings. Mm. So I used to treat fallout from John Kabat-Zinn's pro stress management program. And people would come in and they're like, I flunked out of stress management. I'm such a loser. And I'd be like, no, you didn't. So I'd send them another letter and say, look, you need to warn people if they have a pile of unprocessed trauma, they may relax their surface defenses and boom, get like flashbacks. I teach things more like safe space imagery that teaches people to block out intrusive thoughts and feelings. And if people want to meditate, they meditate in their safe space. Gotcha. And okay. the other thing about DBT is that Generally speaking, DBT therapists don't want parts participating. So if I send, I've sent a lot of people to DBT, but we work with their parts first. And it's like all the parts need to be listening or they don't have to, but the part who goes needs to teach everyone the skills. Mm. I had a client who they finally kicked him out of DBT. They said, you could teach this. None of his parts knew any of it. Wow. But he could have taught the class. Well, that reminds me of that. What you're saying is the internal communication was so important with dissociative disorders, especially so that because there are cement walls between all of yeah. them. Yeah. So it, you need to be able to access them. 
Yeah, right. Or, and teach them, you know, it's, I don't want all parts to be present all the time. Right. Because they're holding different burdens of different kinds of traumatic material. I don't want them all working on trauma at the same time because it, it's going to be too dysregulating. So I'm yeah. like, yeah, you set a you set of parts, you know, go to your safe space, put up soundproofing and feeling proofing. And that is their contribution to working through this traumatic material. And then when we finish unburdening with whoever we're working with, um, that kind of sense of settledness and confidence is transferred among the parts. Mm. You know, everybody feels better, although it may not show up exactly like that. And then the cooperation, right? Because you're sending parts to a safe space and they're going and then there's like a, a sense of cooperation between them. Right. Or simply a woman I work with who had a very big job and had done a lot of therapy, not IFS in this case. And then she moved out of state and fell apart, had to leave her big job, went out on disability, was in the hospital, was had shock treatment. I finally got her. We started working on things and eventually she got a job as a bagger. And there was a guy who was in line behind her and a part got triggered. And so she said to the part, we're at the supermarket. It's perfectly safe here. There's security guards. Nobody's going to hurt us. Do you want to go to your safe space or do you want to stay out and watch? And if you go to your safe space, we'll talk about it later. And so the part said she'd stay and watch. So, you know, that's just an example of some internal communication and cooperation. Like I also teach people how to do the fire drill. You know, it's yeah. like that's great. Yeah. Do the fire drill. Yeah. Before you go to work, do the fire drill before you go visit your parents at Thanksgiving and let's work on coping skills. Who can manage it? Who can't? I love that. Yes. Or I'll give you another example. And this was not somebody with a dissociative disorder. It was someone who came in for a consult and right at the end of the, it told me she had to go to court the next day. And someone steeped in IFS and uh, was just a consult. And, but I found out there was a part that liked to confess. And so that's not good if you're going to court. (laughs) And so we made a safe space for this part on a beach and put up sound and feeling proofing. And the part said, you mean, I don't have to go to court. I said, Nope. And the part's like, oh, I'm staying here. So the part just stayed in the safe space. I assume court went better, but you know, it was just a quick consult, but that's an example of something where you couldn't have taken the time to do witnessing or figuring stuff out, or even the fire drill might've been hard for that part. If that part heard what was going on in court, way better for that part to have a safe space. Yeah, I love that. And I think people don't know, this was coming up for me, people don't know that that's an option, right? So you're you're saying, here's a coping skill that's so IFSE that's very like, connect with like before, like the, right before, as we're all thinking about Thanksgiving right now, we all have parts up, I'm sure, what, whatever that is. And, and so just checking in with those parts before you go to the family dinner or before you spend the day by yourself or before whatever happens and letting them know they don't actually have to so the one that's angry at your mother-in-law or the one that hates your sister, they don't actually have to be there at the Thanksgiving table. And I don't know that people don't know that that's an option. Yeah, and it's so simple. I mean, it's it's such a nice concept. And yeah. I think, you know, one of the concerns are that teaching coping skills disses managers. Managers yeah. don't like it. They feel like you're taking their job away. And I think that might have something to do with um, perhaps presenting teaching coping skills in a different way. 
I've never had a manager complain about having more tools to deal with things. Yeah. It's kind of like I, I've been writing this book on internal family systems, integrating the knowledge from the trauma and dissociation world with internal family systems. And I think I wrote in it, you know, it's kind of like if you only have a hammer, then all your problems have to be nails. Well, what I want to do is give people a toolbox. Yeah. I want them to have more than just a hammer. Well, and you're saying I'm working with the managers. I'm not bypassing the managers. You're actually no. handing the manager more tools. And more choices and more control. Yeah. And managers tend to be tired. You know, because they've been like doing all this work, trying to keep everything going. And so it's like, oh, <laughs> this, this works really well. You know, this is helpful or it's helpful to have exiles in a safe space um, where their feelings aren't flooding the system. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, this makes it easier to manage. And we're not forgetting the exiles. It's like, when it's the right time, we're definitely working with them. I love it. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And so I just want to check in because I, I also want to talk about hypnotic language. Oh, and, yeah. And helping people use the trance. The, this is what you said the other day, and I wrote it down. Helping people use the trance they're already in for healing. What does that even mean? <laughs> Well, dissociative disorder, dissociation is a trance dynamic. And a trance is just focused, focused attention. I mean, that's the simplest, most direct um, meaning of trance. And IFS is very trancey. So, you know, if you say, go inside and notice what you're feeling. Going inside is a trancey kind of thing. That's every induction has something to do with going inside and you're reducing your field of awareness. And then it's easier to access parts. People with dissociative disorders are in trance a lot. I mean, they've got parts who are living in the past who believe they're living in the past. They're importing anxiety from all sorts of places that aren't present. Um, and so basically it's noticing what trance is switching from one part to another is a trancy thing or a part, you know, being so locked into where they think they are. They don't know anything about the present. I mean, that's all possible because of trance logic and, um, and there's a lot of trance dynamics around abuse, you know, if somebody is raping their kid, the kid's going to be very focused. Pain is very focusing. Terror is very focusing. And so it's helpful to kind of be in a similar state to be able to help them get out of that. Mm, uh, yeah. Like, I'm bad. You know, anything a parent says while they're abusing a kid is going to go in on a deeper level because that's a kind of trance induction to, you know, be battering a kid yeah. so much that their focus is riveted. Mm. So, or they are floating on the ceiling. So a chapter I wrote in this book I'm about to finish <laughs> is on hypnotic language. And it's fairly simple, you know, hypnotic, there's nothing, it's not rocket science. It's and although I, I have hypnosis training, I'm a crew consultant for ASH, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. I don't use a lot of formal hypnosis. I use hypnotic language, like um, positive suggestion. If you say, see if you can find a part inside. Somebody who's brought up with lots of negatives will say, I can't. Versus saying, focus inside and connect with the part. That's, that's po a positive suggestion. And then if they say, I don't notice anything, well, that part's listening 
already. And you haven't connected with that part yet. Yet is a, it will be happening kind of word. Um, try to do this. No, I can't. Do this. You got a better chance of it happening. It's kind of creepy though. <laughs> it's kind of creepy that we, I don't well, you know. know it's, it's a it part of me, really I guess. Creepy, what's really creepy is looking up stuff like seducing women and hypnosis. And you can look that kind of stuff up. I tell my clients or, or sales stuff and hypnosis or cults use a lot of hypnotic mm. inductions on people they're trying to suck in. Mm. And what I say to my clients is, you know, it's kind of like a rolling pin. You can make, the, you can beat the crap out of someone with a rolling pin or you can make a pie crust. <laughs> you know, anything can be twisted. So. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, <also> okay. True. <laughs> yes, this is very true. Um, so you also wrote a chapter, speaking of your writing, you wrote a chapter in one of the IFS books on dissociation. What book was that? Mm -hmm. If people are curious about that, what do you remember what book that was? It's Ellen Ziskin and Martha Sweezy edited it. And I think it might be called something like IFS and Special Populations. Okay. It was the first book that they collaborated on. Okay, great. And there's okay. a bunch of useful chapters in it. Okay, great. And then if people want to uh, consult with you or want to find out more about you or when your book is coming out, when, where, where can they do that? Like, do you have a website? <laughs> oh, I need to work on a website. <laughs> the other thing that's going on is my mother is just dying. And that is like adding a layer of stress for some yeah. of my parts, I would say. Yeah. And so... <laughs> There's all this legal, there's just a bunch of stuff that's going on. And so now is not the best time to get in touch with me. <laughs> okay. So this is coming or, out in uh, November, 2021. So what I've learned, because this is going to be like the 105th episode, is that people listen to them. Like people are just finding out about the podcast now. So if you're listening to this a year or two from now, then oh yeah, you no might problem. be more available. And the other thing is that, um, I'm a little more disorganized these days. Yeah, of course. I mean, you I are. always tend to be a little disorganized, <laughs> but I'm even more disorganized. So if you want maybe to your email. With, yeah, my email is j.twombly at verizon.net. And Twombly is T W O M B L Y. And if I don't respond, just bug me. <laughs> you know, like it's not because I don't have good intentions, it's just that I'm buried. Yeah. Yeah. You got a lot going on. Um, so just bug me. I'm totally <laughs> buggable. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I bugged you enough that we finally got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> me too, Tammy. <laughs> Very kind of you. <laughs> and is there anything else you want to say before we, before we end or before I ask you the last question, I'll ask you the last question. I guess what I'd like to say is I think this book will be useful. And not just for people who work with big trauma. I think some of the stuff in it, like the chapter on hypnotic language is just really useful. And it's kind of like, okay, so if somebody doesn't have a humongous trauma history, you know, obviously everything works, but, you know, it could work a little smoother. So, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of would enhance any kind of therapy you're doing. I'm and, like, or parenting <laughs> or parenting. No, seriously, parenting too. Um, and um, I mean, actually a lot of, uh, I know a lot of people who've taught their kids safe space imagery so that they could go to sleep at night. I love that. That is you such know? a good idea. I love that. Or and when they go to school a, like this. Yeah, uh, I love that. That's and then great. there's a chapter on premature, like when, what do you do when you have to prematurely end with someone, either because you're booting them or you've suddenly gotten an illness or you don't have the skills to work with somebody. And, um, you know, so there's some things in it that I think are sort of universally useful. Um, even though it's most, most of the focus is on DID and OSDD. 
which is what they used to call BDNOS. It's basically DID, but the parts don't come out independently. Don't they stay inside more? There's less amnesia. Mm. Um. Okay, so we were super excited about your book. Do you have an idea of when it's coming out, or just maybe next <laughs> I year? Blew through my last um, due date. I'm. Um, yeah, it'll come out next year. Well, let us know because we would love to um, promote it and let everybody know about it for sure. Absolutely. And then the last question is, if you weren't doing all you're doing and even taking care of your mom and taking care of all of the therapists that need you and all the clients that need you, what would you do instead? I think I be on an island that has really good scuba diving and a bunch of palm trees and writing fiction. That sounds lovely. Um, that sounds fantastic. Have you read anything good lately? I like the over story Ooh. and Louise Penny books. Mm -hmm. um, but the over story is about trees and the, I happened to listen to that one and the reader's fabulous. And it's, and it's just, it's called the overstory. Yeah. Okay. I'll read it. Thank you. <laughs> Let me know what you think. I will. I totally will. Um, well, thank you so much. This was great. It was nice to meet you. And this was really interesting. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> thank you. It was fun. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.